All right, the records reflect that Detective Tom Lang is still on the witness stand. Good morning again, Detective. You reminded your story under oath. Mr. Cochran, you may continue with your cross-examination. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Detective Lang, um, just when we took the break, we were looking, we, we had an occasion during the break to look at your notes and with regard to the Bundy crime scene. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, with regard to the notes, um, what's contained in the book before you are your original notes that were written at or about the time uh, of your observations at the scene. Is that correct? Yes. And you shared those with, with me, and by and large, I have copies of those. Is that correct? Yes. Now, for instance, I, uh, I have a question for you. With regard to the question of the liver temperature on Nicole Brown Simpson, from a chronological standpoint, I believe you told us that her liver temperature was taken after Mr. Goldman's temperature. Is that correct? That's my recollection. Because his was taken at the scene, is your recollection, and then hers was taken later in the, in the coroner's van. Is that correct? Yes. So now, chronologically, if you're looking at your notes at the bottom of uh, 0548, you have her liver temperature. Would that have been put in there after you discovered that information? Look at the bottom of 0548. That would have been put in there at the time that I received the information, yes. All right. So that the fact that it may come before Goldman, you kept it uh, in order under, under, under Nicole Brown Simpson. Is that correct? The fact that it came before Goldman? Well, I believe it was subsequent to Goldman. Yeah. Well, the fact that in your notes it appears at a time before we talk about Mr. Goldman is of no particular consequence. Is that correct? Other than that's the time that uh, the temperature was taken. And uh, is it your recollection that um, with regard to the liver temperatures of both uh, individuals that they both had the, uh, the same liver temperature? Yes. And it's your recollection again that uh, you saw the liver temperature of Goldman being taken there at the scene, right? I believe I did, yes. And uh, from look, remembering that video, both bodies were basically moved to about the same place before they were placed on the coroner's gurney. Is, is that correct? Sustained. Let me phrase the question. All right. Um, you remember seeing the video, do you not, with regard to um, the removal of the body of Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson? Yes. And uh, thereafter, Mr. Goldman's body was brought over to that same general area on the walkway before it was placed on the gurney, isn't that correct? Yes. And uh, were both bodies removed by this coroner's investigator by the name of Jacopo? With the assistance of Radcliffe, yes. All right. What is, uh, the, if you know, what is the difference in their, their two particular functions with the coroner's office? The lady, Miss Ratcliffe, and the, and the gentleman who's wearing the blue, blue jumpsuit. Miss uh, Ratcliffe is a coroner's investigator, and uh, the other gentleman is a uh, coroner's uh, driver and assistant. And have you worked or met, worked with those two individuals before on other cases? I don't recall if I have or not. All right, now, last week I had asked you some questions about the, uh, the envelope that contains uh, uh, the one lens therein. Do you recall that? Yes. Now, the first time that you had occasion to look uh, inside that. Oh, well. what, when was? You just said yes. Let me see counsel at sidebar without the report. Mr. Carpenter, you're going to withdraw the last question? Yeah, I answer. will, Your Honor, just for clarity and to move this matter on. All right, thank you. Jury's uh, disregard the last question and answer. Uh, with regard to um, 
the envelope uh, that was found at the scene that uh, contained the eyeglasses. You recall some questions about that last week? Yes. Can you tell us uh, what date it was that you had occasion, if any, to look inside that envelope? I peered inside an opening in the envelope on the morning of the 13th. All right, and where were you when you peered inside an opening in the envelope at that time? Well, standing, uh, basically standing over it. And that was in the early morning hours during the course of your Bundy crime scene investigation? Yes. And uh, when you said there was an opening, did you make an opening to it, or was there already an opening in the envelope at that point? No, there was a, a small opening that I could peer into. Was the envelope... Uh, how was it laying? Was it laying? Uh, was there some writing on that envelope? There was writing on the uh, underside, the bottom side. All right. So that the 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 part with the writing was was line, was against the ground. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And your observations were made as you stood above the envelope, and you uh, did you peer inside of it? Yes. And when you looked inside, what did you see, Detective Lane? If anything, what appeared to be a pair of eyeglasses. And did you notice at that time how many lenses that these eyeglasses have? No, I wouldn't have been able to see that. All right. So at this point, you can't tell us whether it was one lens or two lenses. Is that correct? That's correct. Did, did you ever, in the course of your investigation, go back and ascertain when the glasses were found over at Metzaluna, how many lenses were there? I don't believe so. So did you ever talk to the owner of the glasses? Uh, with regard to the fact of, at some point, I presume they had two lenses in those glasses. Is that correct? I excuse me, counsel. Won't you approach without the report, please? Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Right, thank you. And I understand that the envelope containing the glasses are not here today, so uh, in that connection, I'm probably going to have to mark as a, a photograph of, 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 of a supposed to be the envelope. I'll have to show the detective laying that. Right. Defense next in order is 1047. 1047. All right, Mr. Cochran, you're going to withdraw 1047? Yes, Your Honor, I have another photograph. I think it's uh, 
uh, People's 104, I guess, for identification. Um, they all uh, Detective Lang, with regard to. Um, I think Mr. Ferretlow needs the uh, barcode back. Can we bring that up? Detective Lang, have you seen that, um, what's depicted there of the four, sir? Yes. And uh, was the envelope um, in that approximate condition when you saw it at the scene before you peered inside of it? I believe so. If you can tell us, and you may have to step down, I, what I wanted to find out was how did you peer inside the envelope? We don't have the envelope here this morning, which is the problem. So if you can help us with that and paint a word picture, picture for the jury as to how you peered inside the envelope, sir. Well, I peered inside it by standing over it and bending over. And if you notice in the upper left quadrant, there is the opening that I earlier alluded to. And that's what I looked into. Can you say the upper left quadrant? Yes. Can you uh, step down and point that out so everybody's clear? Do you need a um, pointer? It's right out in this area right here. All right. Your Honor, he's indicating in the, uh, the upper left quadrant of the, of the envelope near the top. Yes. All right. And so you looked inside from that vantage point. Is that correct, sir? Uh, yes. And what did you see? Now, you saw these glasses, then you saw what else? appeared to me to be uh, a pair of glasses. I, I didn't see a whole lot more. You can't see a whole lot to the little crack. Right. And you never, that's as much as you saw at that time. Is that correct? Yes. And in your notes, uh, uh, did you ever ascertain, well, there, you may resume your seat, sir. Did you ever ascertain whether or not there was more than one lens inside that envelope? I did not. And so you don't know at this point. Is that correct? I don't know. Were you ever told after you were on the witness stand last week that uh, there's only one lens found in that envelope at some later time? Were you ever told that? I believe you mentioned that. All right. And did anybody else ever tell you that other than myself? Any no. Questions? Now, do you, did you note this in your notes at all as to anything about lenses, the lenses, we've been, the notes we've been talking about? No. So uh, you don't indicate in your notes whether or not there were one lens or two lenses? Again, I, I don't recall seeing one or two uh, lenses. You just saw these glasses, is that right? They appeared to be a pair of glasses in the envelope, yes. Do you know whether or not there was a, ever a picture taken of these glasses uh, at the time the envelope was booked? At the time it was booked? Yes. I don't believe there would have been, no. It would have been booked in that same condition it now appears on the, on the Elmo? It should have been, yes. Now, with regard to, uh, I asked you some questions before about the moving evidence. Um, in any of your notes or any of your reports, did you ever at any time note that any of the evidence had actually been moved? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, it's preliminary. Oh, well. No. And the evidence, as I understand it, that we have of the evidence being moved are the photos themselves. Is that correct? Photographs, that's correct. Did you ever, did you find some kind of a Bonita Ecuador label? somewhere out at that scene that day? Yes. And uh, what is a Bonita Ecuador label? It appeared to me to be a, a small sticker label uh, that uh, perhaps would go on a piece of fruit. And where did you find this particular uh, label, sir? It was found uh, near the East pole of the stationary gate east of the sidewalk, I believe two or three inches uh, from that location. Uh, where is that label now? I believe it was booked into evidence. All right, have you seen it recently? No. And when you say it was found near the east pole, where it was on the ground, where was it? It was on the ground, yes. And it was in booked into evidence, is that correct? Yes. And with regard to that, when's the last time you saw that, that, that label? 
The last, like a, a banana, some kind of fruit? I suppose it's possible. <laughs> you don't know where that label is today, do you? Where it is? Yes, where it is, President. It's at Scientific Investigation Division. So it still be at LAPD? Yes. So if we wanted to get it brought over, you could do that for us? I could probably see that it was done, yes. Over the lunch hour? Certainly. Do you recall any photographs being taken of that label? The label appears in one photograph, uh, but not a close-up shot. It's an overall shot. All right. Now, with regard to uh, Mr. Goldman, did you on the date of June 13th or any time around that time conduct any investigation by going personally to Mr. Goldman's apartment to try and trace his activities um, on the evening hours of June 12th, 1994? Uh, I did not. I had uh, two other detectives do that. And who were they? Detectives Tippin and Carr. And what did you have them do, if you recall? They uh, went to Mr. Uh, Goldman's uh, residence. But let me kind of stop you there for a minute. What, when did they first go to Mr. Goldman's residence? When? Yes, when, sir? I don't recall. It was after the 13th. I don't specifically recall the date. They have a log. All right, they have a log. Yes. Does your log indicate at all when they went? I don't believe it would be in my log. It should be in their log. Okay, and that would be in Tippin and whom else? Carr. And Carr. Now, I, I interrupted you. What, what do they do? as best you can recall, with regard to Mr. Goldman. Conducted an investigation at uh, Mr. Goldman's uh, apartment. And uh, do they go through some kind of a day book or a notebook of his and look through certain papers? Is that correct? I believe they did. And uh, we've been provided with copies of that. Is that correct? I believe so. Now, in that connection, uh, as the investigating officer in this case, would it be relevant to you to know, um, for instance, what time Mr. Goldman had his last meal that evening? It certainly could be, yes. And did you ascertain where and when he had his last meal and what time? I did not. You did not do that? No. Uh, with regard to Mr. Goldman's stomach contents, they were not thrown away, as with Ms. Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson. Isn't that correct? That's my understanding. And so the stomach contents were available. And have you, in the course of your investigation, had occasion to examine the stomach contents or discuss that with the coroner to assist you in extrapolating backwards as to when Mr. Goldman might have had his last meal prior to the time of his death? That examination. Objection, Oh, well. That examination uh, would be conducted by the coroner's office. All right, but you, as uh, you were present during the autopsy, were you not? That's correct. And you're the exec you're the exec you're the uh, investigating officer, one of them. Is that right? That's correct. Time of death is critical in this case, is it not? Yes. And did you talk to the coroner's office about the stomach contents of Mr. Goldman, to try and determine when, when, and when he had his last meal and at what time? We discussed uh, time of death in regards to uh, stomach contents. And the fact that digestion could be retarded if one were under a great deal of stress. Consequently, the findings uh, regarding the contents in the stomach uh, may not always be accurate. Well, well who told you that uh, anyone was under a great deal of stress? Who told me? Yes, who told you that? Uh, that's my opinion, that uh, both of these victims would certainly be under a great deal of stress. All right, well, what we're talking about is the stomach contents and the condition they existed before the time of death, officer. Isn't that correct? In other words, isn't that what we're talking about? I don't know. I right. assumed well, you were asking me about stomach contents as they relate to time of death. Yes, sir. Uh, did you do anything to determine what time Mr. Goldman had his last meal? <clears throat> no. Mr. Goldman had been working I understand uh, that. several hours well, prior to that. And as far as I, my information was, he didn't have a meal. He may have eaten something, but well, I had no information as to him eating a meal. Did you, would it be important in the course of your investigation to try and determine where Mr. Goldman went after he got off work? Yes. Did you do anything to try and determine that? Yes. And what did you do in that connection? 
Detectives Tippin and Carr investigated at Mr. Goldman's apartment and found clothing that he had been wearing that night at work at Mezzaluna. Were the clothing, was that clothing in a bag of some kind? I don't recall if it was in a bag or not. Did you look inside the pockets of that clothing? Did I? No. Did they look inside the pockets, if you know? I don't know. Do you know whether or not there were any notes found in or about those, the, the clothing of Mr. Goldman's? Uh, none were brought to my attention. May I ask you about some evidence? All right. Sure. May I approach her? You may. I'm going to place uh, what I think is, I think it's 30 for a notification before you and ask you to open this bag and take the contents out. This, this reports to be uh, Mr. Goldman's clothes he was wearing sometime earlier that evening. Is that correct, uh, Detective Lane? I'm checking. They appear to be yes. Would you like me to remove them? Yes, please. Moving a pair of pants. Appears to be a shirt, not a hanger. All right, anything else in the bag? There's an envelope, it appears to be. Can you check that out? One piece screen paper with writing from brown paper bag dated 2-18-95. All right, can you open that? Please. And tearing a piece of tape that's initialed on the back. It's a green scrap of paper. All right. What Look at that paper. You seen this before? No. What is this? What is this paper? Appears to be some kind of a shopping list. A laundry list? A shopping list? Yes. All right. Now this. What is? Once you read what that has on it. Vegetables, turkey, tomatoes, lettuce, chicken, asparagus, broccoli, sugar-free ice cream. You can't make out this one here. Pretzels, perhaps. Have you ever seen that list before? No. And this bag, uh, with regard to this, this is a pavilion's bag, Bond's pavilion's bag. Um, how was the, how were these clothes recovered, and what's the connection of the bag with the clothes? Uh, once again, they were recovered by detectives Tippin and Carr. I wasn't there. I, I couldn't answer that. But it was booked in the Bond's pavilion bag, along with this envelope. Is that correct? Apparently. Did they, did, did the detectives under, and you see banana on there also? Excuse me, counsel. Without the reporter.
this um, this bag and the envelope and the green list is now in ev is now marked for evidence. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Do you know who wrote that list? No. Had you ever seen that green list before this? Uh, no, I haven't. Have you looked inside those clothes, looked in the pockets inside those clothes before? I have not. Can you do that? I looked inside each of the pockets? Yes. All right. Did you find anything in there? No. All right. Now, then with regard to this list, we don't know at this point whose handwriting that is? I don't. Correct. All right. And uh, is there, I was asking just before the clerk called us over, is there a banana on the top of that list, on the upper right hand? Top of the list? Yes. Uh, this is Bonita Ecuador label. Is that a label found on bananas off times? I don't know. You've never seen that? No. Now, Now, the, with regard to these clothes, were these clothes recovered by the two detectives from the apartment that night? That's my understanding. And they then booked it into evidence thereafter in the condition we just saw it in. Is that right? Uh, I believe so. Did you, in the course of the, the, your investigation and the gentleman that you used in this investigation, did you ever try and ascertain whether or not after Mr. Goldman left work, he went someplace and ate. I don't believe that that came up uh, due to the fact we believe that he went directly to his home and changed in the time that uh, he left the Mezzaluna. All right. Now, if he had a full stomach of food, undigested food, would that indicate to you that if he didn't eat at Metzalona and he still had a full stomach of food at the time of death, that he may have eaten someplace? It's possible, sure. All right. And as such, as an investigator... Objection, that assumes fact, not evidence. Said, oh, as an investigator, don't you want to determine all kinds of possibilities, sir? And that's the question. Yeah. Oh, all kinds of possibilities in regards to what? Well, all the various possible scenarios. Don't you want to consider that? Scenarios? Well, let, let me rephrase it, sir. With regard to Mr. Goldman's stomach contents, that's an indication he had eaten something somewhere that night. Did you go back and check at Metzaluna and determine whether or not he had a meal at Metzaluna before he left? I don't believe he did. All right. So your answer is yes, you checked that, and he didn't. All right. If he didn't eat at Metzaluna, as an investigator, did you then say, well, I better check and see where he had this meal, if any? Did you check that out? That's my question. That did not come into play, no. All right, so you didn't check it out. Is that your answer? And I had no reason to. All right, and the question is, did you check it out? Uh, the answer is no. All right. And so when you were at the coroner's office and at the time of the autopsy, with regard to these stomach contents, you, you have not had uh, anyone in the coroner's office to try and determine by looking at the stomach contents, when Mr. Goldman might have had his last meal, is that as we sit here now, is that correct? That's what they do at the coroner's office. Uh, I'm asking what you did in this case. I didn't examine the contents. Right. I don't examine stomach contents. And did you have any expert medical forensic person look at these stomach contents to try and determine how long he'd had this meal before he died? Did you do that? Did I do that? Yes. No, that would have been right. done by the coroner's office. Did you ask the coroner, any coroner, to do that? Again, that would be something that would fall under their purview. And you would never make that suggestion to him at all? To? To the coroner's office. To Don't do you work what? together with them? What suggestion? 
that they look at the stomach contents to try to determine the time of death. I believe the coroner's office does that. We don't normally dictate to them how to do their investigations. And you made no suggestion to them at all regarding the stomach contents in this case? I don't believe I did. Do you have any reports from them regarding the Goldman stomach contents? Any reports on that from would, the be, coroner's office. would be in the uh, coroner's protocol. Did you ever have occasion <clears throat> to look at Mr. Goldman's beeper entries uh, uh, you remember you described for us that he had a beeper there at the scene. Did you go back and try to look at earlier beeper entries on June 12th, 1994? Yes. yes. All right, and what were the results of that? There were none. Now, with regard to the items found uh, at the Goldman apartment, did you find any information where Mr. Goldman had Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's phone number there? Again, I didn't investigate uh, or examine anything at that location that may, uh, that may have happened. I, I don't recall seeing it. Have you, have you had occasion to look at the, the notes of items taken in, uh, from, I guess, the Goldman apartment? Not in some time. All right. Do you recall that Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's phone number appears twice in these copies? Do you recall that? That may well be. May I approach your own? You may. If I were to show you copy with that refresh I was thinking about that, but then we started talking about content of the apartment again. You know, I've placed before I've showed this to council. Uh, I want you to look at this, uh, read this to yourself, first of all. It's DA003953. You see that? Yes. And there's a fo apparently a phone number there without reading that phone number. There's a phone number there also, right? Yes. And look also next at DA003955. You see uh, that name there? Yes. You see that phone number there? That's correct. Okay. Does that appear to be Nicole Simpson? Yes. And her phone number? Yes. And so you see at least on two occasions her numbers uh, found in these documents that were allegedly found in Mr. Goldman's apartment? Yes. And uh, in fairness, there are other female numbers, other female names with numbers therein also. Yes, sir. Right? Yes. But her number's in there twice. Is that right? That's correct. Is that a fresh recollection? Yes. All right. Have you, by the way, have you had occasion to review these uh, documents here, uh, which purport to have come either from uh, some kind of a booklet or something inside the apartment? Not recently. Uh, did you ever review them? I believe initially I did, yes. Did you follow up on any of the names of the people contained in this, this information? I don't recall if I specifically did, or Tippin and Carr did, or if it was done at all. Did you find out what design wrap is? Design wrap, W-R-A-P, -W right? No. Was that a business that Mr. Goldman was involved in? I don't know. You never looked at that either? No. Did you ever consider that Mr. Goldman may have been the target of the assassin or assassins that particular night? Did you ever consider that at all? The target of an assassin? Oh, no. Was he the, the target of the perpetrators on June 12th, the perpetrator of perpetrators on June 12th, 1994, when he came to Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson's residence? Did you ever consider that as a, as a, as a possible theory? That he would be the target? Yes, let me see if I can make it so you understand it. Did you ever, as the investigating officer in this case, ever consider any other theory than that O.J. Simpson was the only perpetrator in this case? Any other theory? Yes, any other theory, any other possibilities. I had absolutely no other evidence that would point me in any other direction. Did you ever consider that Mr. Goldman 
could have been a person followed to that location. Did you ever consider that at all? I think it's entirely possible he was followed. All right. Do you think, did you ever consider that something regarding him or his background may have led some persons or persons to follow him there to that location? I had no evidence at all to suggest that. And so did you ever pursue that or look at it at all? There was nothing to pursue. There was you, nothing to show any evidence to that. You never looked at, any of, the, you never looked at uh, any of the people in his book or made any determinations about his background? You didn't do that? Again, I believe I did go through the book initially. Uh, I believe Tiffin and Carr did. Uh, but there was nothing in that book to lead in any other direction. All right, so you didn't do anything about that, right? About? About following up on any other leads or anything regarding Mr. Goldman. I didn't see any other leads to follow up on. All right. Now, with regard to uh, uh, Mr. Goldman, you have, I believe, shared with us that he drove a vehicle to Ms. Uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's residence that night. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, you know what time he got off work. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, you know at some point he came home. Is that correct? I believe that's what happened, yes. And were you aware of whether, and he changed clothes, is that correct? Yes. Are you aware of whether or not he showered before he left his place? No. You have no knowledge one way or the other? No. Do you know whether or not, uh, when did Tippin and Carr get there? Was it, were they able to make any kind of determination by getting to the scene or Mr. Goldman's residence quickly after uh, these bodies were discovered? They didn't respond uh, till the next day, I believe. So the next day would have been what day, the 13th or the 14th? Uh, I don't recall exactly. I believe it was the uh, 14th. So the 14th of June. It may have been the 13th. I, I don't have their log, and I haven't looked at it in months. All right. So at any rate, you can't tell us whether or not he showered or whatever. Is that correct? I can't. That's correct. You, you cannot tell us, uh, and then you can't tell us whether or not he went and had a meal or ate with somebody, can you? It's my information and my belief that he didn't. All right, but yet you know that he had a stomach of food, an unge undigested food, isn't that correct? I believe he did. All right, you can't, you sit here now, you can't tell us when he ate that food, can you? Specifically, no, yes. but right. I'm aware that he works at a restaurant and right. would probably eaten during that time. Sir, but did you not tell us you spoke at Metzaloon and they told you he had not eaten there that evening? Did you check on that? Not a, necessarily to sit down and have a meal, but uh, whether he was observed during his entire tour of duty there, I, I don't know. He may have well eaten something there. Well, perhaps he did, but if he ate at 6 o'clock in the evening, you'd expect that would have been digested. Would you not have? Objections beyond so Well, oh, that's common sense. Objection, this is not a doctor. You didn't know. Foundation? No foundation. Sustained. Thank you. With regard to, uh, as, as an human being, as an investigator, as a, someone with common sense, if one eats a meal at 6 o'clock p.m., would you expect that that meal through the digestive processes would have started to uh, become digested over a period of four or five hours? Would you expect that? No foundation. Sustain. Why don't you ask a few foundational questions? Certainly. As, as, a, as a homicide investigator of 20 plus years, You've uh, attended a number of autopsies, have you not? Yes. And you've seen stomach contents on numerous occasions, have you not? Yes. And you know something about the rate with which the body digests food, do you not? Yes. And you know that over a period of time the body will digest food and process it. You know that, don't you? Yes. And you know that if a person has a relatively undigested food, that's an indication that they have recently had a meal. Isn't that correct, sir? Possibly. Foundation, Your Honor. All right, I'll rule. Thank you. Forgot what the question was. Now, Your Honor. Um, sort of a rhetorical, I mean, an argumentative question in the sense that if you have full stomach contents, right. I mean, let me see if I can restate in a fashion that will not be. And you know, based upon your experience, that if a person has a relatively full, undigested stomach of food. It's an indication they've re probably eaten recently before they met their death. Isn't that a fair statement? Depends on what you mean by recently. Well, within an hour or so. Again, that's not necessarily true when the digestion can be retarded. Sir, if your digestion, of course, when you die, the digestive process stops. Isn't that correct? Yes. All right. And if you, uh, are you telling us that this stressful situation 
of the fight that took place between Mr. Goldman and whoever the perpetrator or perpetrators were that night lasted for a half hour or so, you think? No. I think it was a stressful situation that lasted for 15, 15 minutes or more? I don't believe it did. Well, let's talk about the time before the stressful situation when your body would normally process and digest food, okay? In that instance, in this case, have you spoken to any expert forensic pathologist about the state of the stomach contents of Mr. Goldman that night and whether or not that expert can help us and assist us in determining when Mr. Goldman had his last meal? It's very relevant, Your Honor. It's relevant. Overall. Speaking of objection, Your Honor. Speaking of objection. All right, you may answer. Have you? Regarding time of death? Yes. Yes, that and uh, the other factors uh, and a time of death was given to me between 9 p.m. and 12 midnight, closer to 9. That's not the question I ask you. The question I'm is, sorry. have you talked to a forensic pathologist with regard to Mr. Goldman's stomach contents? And has that forensic pathologist been able to look at the state of those, of those stomach contents and assist us in determining when Mr. Goldman had his last meal? Specifically as to the stomach contents, yes. no. Can we talk about stomach contents? No is the answer? That's correct. And so here we are, and you strike that. What doctors have you talked to with connection, uh, forensic doctors you've talked to in connection with this case in your investigation? Can you give us their names? Dr. Golden. And he's the gentleman who performed the uh, two autopsies? That's correct. Are you aware that the coroner's office has pre prepared a list of at least 16 items that they themselves sustained? <clears throat> like to be heard on that, Your Honor. Sustained. All right. Now, with regard to uh, Dr. Golden, give us the name of any other doctors. Dr. Lakshmanan. And he is the coroner? Yes. All right. Who else? Dr. Sherry. Spell that for us. S-H-E-R-R-Y. S H S H E R R Y. All right. Who else? I believe that's it. At any rate, when you were at the scene at Bundy in the early morning hours, you did never you never dispatched any police officers to go to Mr. Goldman's home and search for any clues at that time, did you? I didn't know where he lived at that time. Well, you found out sometime that that, that day, did you not? I believe it was later later on. It was sometime on the 13th, wasn't it, officer? I don't recall what it was. Now, with regard to uh, Mr. Goldman, I believe you've indicated to us that uh, there were no bloody footprints which matched his shoes at the scene there at Bundy. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, his shoes had uh, quite a bit of mud under the bottom of them, did they not? I believe there was mud or dirt. And that was in the, consistent with the area where you showed us earlier where this altercation took place and where the ground was dug up. Is that correct? I would say so. And was there some sort of a, did you find some sort of a stain or blood drop under his shoes at all? There were blood droplets on the soles of his shoes, yes. And were you, in the course of your investigation, were you able to ascertain how those blood drops or droplets got under his shoes? I have an opinion how they got there. You were not present, of course, right? When the you were blood not droplets present at the time of this altercation. Yes. No. Yeah. Go, hold on, counsel. You guys are driving the court reporter nuts this morning. You're both talking over each other. Right. Sorry. You. Let me start over. You were not present. Uh, let me strike. Let me strike that, Chairman. With regard to, was there more than was there one blood drop or more than one blood drop under Mr. Goldman's shoes? More than one. How many altogether? There were several, I believe, in both soles of both shoes. All right. And did you conduct some tests on those blood drops or try to conduct some tests to determine when those blood drops were placed there under his shoes? I personally did not, but there were tests conducted. All right. You didn't do it personally? No. It was clear to you that he had not walked through any blood on that walkway that particular night. Is that correct? I don't believe he did. And so, in that instance, 
You never, you, you strike that. You described for us earlier that uh, you, don't, you don't recall seeing any blood under the feet of uh, Ms. Nicole Brown Simpson either. Is that correct? Can you tell us that? That's correct. And once you made your, once you came to your conclusion or you developed your theory that she was killed first, it's true, is it not? You never looked at any other possible theories. Isn't that correct? My theory that she was killed, I, that's not my theory that she was killed first. That was in response to a question as to uh, something that may have possibly happened. Right. Is I that can't tell theory? you who was killed first. Is that your theory, that what? she was killed first? No. That's not your theory? No. You don't believe that? I don't know. All right. And you don't know because you weren't there, is that correct? Certainly. And isn't the whole reason, as a homicide investigator, don't you try to gather all of the facts together and then try to put those facts together and come to some kind of a well-reasoned conclusion? Don't you do that? Certainly. And in the course of that, don't you need all the facts as it relates to the case? It's good to have all the facts, all that you can get, yes. If you jump to a conclusion sometimes, don't you find out later that there were other things that you could have looked at by making a quick decision in a particular case? Okay. Isn't that true? Sustained. You would agree with me that it's not good investigative practices to rush to judgment in a case. Would you agree with that? Certainly. And in this case, uh, you've described for us that um, these crimes occurred on the evening hours of June 12th, 1994. Is that correct? Yes. And I believe you shared with us uh, early on that the complaint in this case was filed on June 17th, 1994. Is that correct? That's correct. And that was on a Friday, is that correct? That's correct. And who was the district attorney who filed these charges? Marcia Clark. And Ms. Clark was at the scene of Rockingham on what date? What's the first time she came to Rockingham that you know of? I believe she was there on the 13th. On that Monday? Yes. And approximately what time? Uh, I wasn't there, I don't know. When you came back from being downtown, um, at Parker Center after about 5 o'clock in the evening. Was she there at that time or had she left by that time, if you know? I don't recall seeing her there. You do not recall seeing her there? I don't recall seeing her there Monday evening. All right. Let me ask you a few questions about, uh, about Rockingham. You described for us that um, you're going over to Rockingham from Bundy. You recall that? Yes. And with regard to... Um, this small red spot on the Bronco. Did you see that yourself? Yes. Who pointed that out to you? Detective Furman. Mark Furman pointed that out to you also? Yes. And uh, can you describe for the jury the size of that, um, this, this uh, purported red spot on the Bronco? I, as to size, I, it certainly wasn't what I would call a, uh, Dime size, it would probably be uh, much smaller than that. Would you say it was smaller than an eraser head and a pencil? I'd say perhaps about that size, maybe smaller. And when you were out there, did you have any pictures taken of this, of this spot or speck? I left before the photographer showed up. Could you see that with the naked eye? Yes. And did you, was it, when you were shown this by, by Mark Furman, was, did you have your flashlight or was it light out by this time? It was light enough to see. And when you were shown this by Furman, were you the only one there at that time? I believe so. Uh, I think Phillips and Van Adder were down the street just a bit. And if you know, were you the first one shown that in sequence? I was the closest to Furman, so I believe I was. All right, and he called you over and showed this to you. And after you saw this, this small, perhaps a racer hit size spot or speck, did you at that point um, look inside the car yourself, look inside this, this vehicle? At that point, no. You didn't look inside with the use of flashlights at all? Not at that point, no. And this was the vehicle that was parked kind of at this funny angle, is that correct? It appeared to be jetting out. The rear end appeared to be jetting out a little bit, yes. Now, you mentioned something about the fact that the, um, you had information that you thought that the maid was supposed to be there. Where'd you get that information from? 
It was relayed to me by Detective Phillips after speaking with the West Tech. This was a, uh, a Sunday evening, early Monday morning, is that correct? This was early Monday morning. All right. And you're aware that maids have days off, are you? Some do and some don't, I imagine. And you, you were, this was hearsay information that you got from Detective Phillips about the maid supposedly being there, is that correct? That would be probably hearsay, yes. Now, you saw... That's not in court. You saw two vehicles in the driveway that evening? Yes, that morning. And at the time that before, the time that you directed Mark Furman to go over this wall, at that point, had you focused on Mr. O.J. Simpson as a suspect in this case? No. So the things you'd seen up to that point did not uh, cause you to believe he was a suspect, right? Specifically recall discussing it with Phillips, Furman, and Van Adder that we felt we had an exigent circumstance and that someone inside could be bleeding or worse. All right, so you were going in to save bodies, is that right? We were going in to uh, investigate if anyone, in fact, uh, had been a victim, yes. And before you went inside, did you look inside the Bronco anymore at all? Either visually or through the use of your flashlight? I don't believe I did at that time, no. You believe what? At that time, no. When both you and Van Adder were at the Rockingham scene, before you went over, had Furman climb over this fence, uh, who was in charge? It would be Van Adder and myself uh, working as partners. It wasn't one person who would be in charge. So you were both co-partners or co-lead -co investigators at, at that point? Yes. <clears throat> now, you shared with us your notes. Um, they were written uh, chronologically at the scene on that particular uh, date, uh, June 13, 1994. With regard to the alleged blood spots that were on the rear gate, did you ever write down or log that the blood spots were uh, that there were blood spots on that rear gate in your notes? I don't believe it did. And that wouldn't that have been an important uh, circumstance? Not necessarily that would fall under the purview of the criminalist collecting them. I see. So a review of your notes indicates you didn't write that down, right? I don't believe it did. And that um, evidence, if it was there, was not collected until approximately three weeks later on July 3rd. Is that right? That's correct. And on July 3rd, you were going to show the DAs a walkthrough at that location. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Ms. Clark and then Mr. Hodgman. Is that correct? Yes. And you call, as I understand, the criminalist to the scene after you got out there on, on July 3rd. Is that correct? After 10 o'clock in the morning? I believe that's that happened, yes. Are we going to something new on this? Because we've <coughs> visited this once thoroughly before. Yeah, just, 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 just cover that shot. Right. Is that correct? Yes. With regard to the lighting that you saw at the Bundy location, you recall testifying uh, for the grand jury in this matter regarding the lighting and the condition of the lighting at the uh, Bundy scene? I recall testifying at the grand jury, but not as to the specifics uh, of the lighting. Well, let me ask you if you, you were asked these questions and gave these answers. Uh, I think it's page I guess it Question, sir. When you arrived, can you tell me if you noticed the lighting in the front of the building there? Was there any? Answer, there was a porch light up the porch. Question, up on the landing. Answer, yes. Question, does that illuminate the walkway? Answer, yes. Question, in any effective way? Answer, it would have illuminated some way. The lighting, I wouldn't say, was excellent but it was far from being dark, uh, it was illuminated. Is that, uh, is that the fresh recollection of your testimony at the grand jury? I would say that if that's what it says, certainly that's what I said. And, and as you think about it, as you sit here now, is that a fair? Yes.
And when I say that was the condition you found it in, answer yes. Now, as you, as you think about it, as you sit here now, is that a fair and accurate description of the lighting that you saw out in Bundy on that night of uh, June 12th in the early morning hours of, uh, of June 13th? No, certainly that's not all the lighting. That was the porch light. I know there's other lights, but is that a, with regard to the lighting that came from the porch light, was that is a fair and accurate statement of the lighting that came from that porch light? As to the walkway, yes. All right. Now, there were other lights also, isn't that correct? Yes. And overall, would you say the lighting there was uh, made the premises far from being dark? Well, that would be a, a subjective call. I, it certainly wasn't pitch black to the extent you couldn't see anything. I'd say the lighting was poor, uh, but still light enough where you could see certain things. All right. With regard to um, the blood spots that um, were going in a westerly direction toward the rear of the, uh, the 875 location, you remember those? Yes. You described for us, I believe, on direct examination that at one point you saw footsteps that turned toward the house. You recall that? They appeared to, yes. And it was. Can you point out if I were to show you, which I believe is 43A, or have 43A put up? Can you get 43A? Perhaps you can point that out for us. Fretlow is looking at that. May I approach your honor? You may. I'd like to have a place of photograph before you. I'm not sure of the number of this photograph, but I see the photographer's number 112 in this photograph off to the left toward the house. I'm going to place this before you. Can you look at that photograph? Do you recognize what's depicted there? Yes, this is the walkway you're looking uh, west. All right. Can you look at that photograph and before I put it on the Elmo, and can you show me where those footsteps are, are that point toward the house? No. In that photograph you can't show? No. Uh, I believe you were shown this photograph before, and you were able to say there was a distance of perhaps three feet between where there's a footprint and where you found a drop of blood, is that correct? Approximately? Looks like a little more, but uh, yes, approximately. All right, and what is your recollection regarding, there's a, there was a blood drop found at the uh, number of the card that indicates 112, is that correct? Yes. And what is your best recollection of how far behind that purported blood drop was the closest set of footprints? I don't recall. I would have to look at the uh, stride analysis or the schematic or some better photographs on this. Did you not tell us there was some kind of a measurement with regard to the, um, the tile or whatever? H how far are each of those tiles? What is the, what's, the, what's the distance of each tile? Uh, I believe it's 11 half by 11 and a half. And your recollection, your belief, your belief was that that 112 was perhaps three, three and a half feet from the nearest footprints. Is that correct? I believe the nearest footprints depicted here. This is a very poor photograph. It's hard to uh, tell with the sunlight on there. All right. This is one of your photographs, but I'll, I'll get see if we can get oh. a better one. Now, can you look on there and tell us where the uh, footprints were turned toward the house? No, again, if I could see a schematic or a better photograph. Right. Uh, now, with regard to the, uh, you mentioned a couple of times, a strat analysis. 
you use some kind of an expert to determine whether or not the person who was who dropped this blood was that person running or walking? Did you find use somebody to try to make that determination? Uh, there were persons who uh, looked at that. Yes. Have you got a report uh, in that connection? You can answer that yes or no. Well, I have a partial report on the stride analysis as to the uh, blood. Uh, I don't. You have a partial report on the stride analysis? Yes. It's your opinion that the person who was heading westbound toward that alleyway was dripping blood, is that correct? Yes. And in that connection, you and I discussed that that was a distance of approximately 120 feet, give or take, is that correct? Approximately, yes. And in that 120 feet distance from the front to the back, you found what you believe to be four blood drops, is that correct? Well, it would be five, including the one in the alley. Well, there's one in the alley, which I'm separating out. That's in the alley. Okay. But four in this walkway area. Is that right? That's correct. Four, four blood drops in this 120 feet area. Is that correct? That's correct. And then the fifth one would be in the alleyway. Is that correct? Yes. And we've established there's no way you could date those footprints, right? Date the footprints? You could date, you strike that. There's no way you could date any blood drops. One cannot necessarily tell the age of a of blood now. Right. And w with regard to um, this matter, did you have an expert who did any kind of a blood spatter anal analysis regarding these uh, blood drops? Uh, there was uh, someone who did look at uh, blood spatter, yes. And do you, you have such an expert? I don't, no. By the way, with regard to the eyeglasses, were the eyeglasses ever uh, checked or analyzed for any trace evidence that might be on them, on the glasses? I don't believe so. I believe, in fact, that they are still in the envelope because tests are being conducted and we're being conducted on the envelope. All right, so your answer is you do not believe that the eyeglasses have been checked for trace, trace I, evidence? I don't know. That's been in the custody of the criminalists for some time. All right, again, but now you talk about the criminalists. The criminalists works, however, under your direction, isn't that correct? At the crime scene, yes. And um, the criminal is not a, is not a police officer. It's That's correct. They're civilian. Civilian employee. Yes. You call them to the scene, is that correct? Generally, yes. And in this case, do you remember what time you called the criminalist to the scene? I did not uh, call the criminalist. Uh, the criminalist, I believe, was uh, called by someone else to the Rockingham location. All right. Who called them to the Rockingham location? I had received information from my partner that the criminalist was en route there, so it was either him or he had someone do it. So you're not for sure who called? No. But at any rate, so that we're clear, the criminalist went to the Rockingham scene before ever coming to the Bundy location, right? Yes. And what was your best approximation of what time did the criminalist arrive at the Bundy crime scene? The Bundy crime scene, I believe the criminalist arrived at uh, approximately 10, 10, 15, somewhere in there. And that would have been approximately an hour after the, the coroner's investigator arrived there at about 9.10, isn't that correct? Yes. In your investigations, do you normally like to have the, the criminalist there before the coroner arrives? Under ideal circumstances, I would like everyone there as soon as they can get there. And as early as possible, isn't that a fair statement? Certainly. Helps you do your job better, isn't that correct? <clears throat> I would say so. So in this instance, if, the, if Risky arrived at the scene at 12.10, the first criminalist on the scene would have been there about 10, after 10 o'clock, 10.15. So perhaps that would be 10 hours and five minutes later. Is that right? I believe that's the way it figures, yes. Bodies had been moved by the time the two criminals got there? I believe they arrived uh, at the time uh, that they were getting uh, examined by the, uh, and moved, yes, about that time. Now, you know, there's an exhibit that I think uh, I want to check it out.
have to take a look. Uh, defendant's 1039, Your Honor. All right. With the reporter, please. 